I'm happy to introduce Dr. Burrowball. Thank you for being here. We look forward to your presentation. First of all, thank you very much, Monsignor, for a kind introduction. You left out one thing, which is that for 15 years I taught at Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit university. And we'll leave it up to the bishop to decide whether it's actually a Catholic university. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get involved in, <laughs> but I taught, I taught for um, 15 years at Georgetown, and one of the, we're here on a very special day, Martin Luther King Day tells us how far America has come and how far America needs to go. And I think we have to be mindful of both. And I want to say that one of the most marvelous achievements of the United States of America has been the notion of civility and mutual respect in interreligious dialogue. And no other place in the world and no other time in the world would rabbis feel as comfortable teaching at Georgetown and at Loyola and at any other university, and would rabbis feel as comfortable talking in a, to a church community and understanding that respect? And no other time in history would a Monsignor be able to read the diary of a young Jewish woman and understand the depth of her spirituality. In a world in which we have an enormous increase in hatred and polarization, I want us to celebrate this great achievement of the United States of America, which gave us not only freedom of religion, but also freedom for religion. And uh, I want us to be mindful of it as we hear all the echoes of hatred and divisiveness. And this is a special moment. We're here also at a special moment because this is the week of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The question always becomes, when do you remember the Holocaust? And one can go through the virtually the entire calendar and say January 30th, 1933, Hitler came to power. One can say January 20th, 1942 was a conference which 15 men gathered. They made a series of not even decisions. The decision was made before. But the implication of the, of the conference can be seen in one statistic. I'm, mind, I'm mindful of the fact that Mark Twain once said there are truth lies in statistics. But this is one statistic. When they met on June 20th, 1942, at something called the Wannsee Conference, 80% of the Jews who were to be murdered in the Holocaust were still alive. 15 months later, 80% were already dead. And they had lifted nothing more difficult than a pen. The day that the world community decided upon was an interesting day. It's the day of the liberation of Auschwitz, in which Soviet troops entered Auschwitz and they discovered what has become the epicenter of evil in the world, the capital of evil in the world. So let me talk about how we got there and what its implications are. Let me also talk about, um, and I'm going to conclude with this, about the incredible transition in Roman Catholic teaching vis-a-vis -vis the Jews by your saints and our saints, St. Saint John the 23rd and St. John Paul II. I, by the way, have a, a unique credential which is that I researched the work of a man who was then Archbishop Rankali in Turkey. And I did a film on that many years ago on the role that uh, John 
Saint John the 23rd played when he was merely an apostolic delegate to Turkey. So I can speak with great authority about some of the formative elements of his. But let's look at a very basic way. The Holocaust has now become what we call one of the defining events of 20th century humanity. Sadly, it has deep and growing implications for 20th, 21st century humanity. And I say in my work that I have a dream, not to God forbid mirror or presume to mirror Martin Luther King only merely to emulate it, my dream is that what I study should become irrelevant because we live in a world in which that could not happen, but that's, that's not the world in which you and I live. The murder of the Jews, and ultimately the Holocaust is expressed in the murder of Jews, two out of three Jews of Europe, systematic murder of Jews in 23 different countries, involve two of the great monotheistic religions, Judaism and Christianity, to a much lesser extent, it involved Islam. It also involved the greatest culture that Western society had produced. Germany had the most advanced science at that point, the most advanced medicine, the most advanced art, the most advanced music, and certainly the most advanced philosophy. Nobody can study philosophy without understanding 18th, 19th, and 20th century German philosophy. And consequently, its evolution, its importance, implicates us all. Destruction of Jews involved, evolved slowly and legally. Discrimination, um, essentially, it began with discrimination and prejudice. It evolved to a legal definition of the Jews based not on the religion that they had or the identity they affirmed, but on the blood of their grandparents. That meant something quite remarkable. I studied Protestant theology with a great Protestant theologian by the name of Eugen Rosenstock Husey. For 12 years, from 1913 to 1935, Eugen Rosenstock Yussi was one of the great philosophers, great theologians, Protestant theologians in Germany. And from 1940 until he died, he was one of the great Protestant theologians in the United States. But for five years, the state defined him as a Jew while the church defined him as a Protestant. You have a Roman Catholic nun was murdered not because she was a Roman Catholic nun, but because her parents were Jews. Edith Stein. And you had the only building standing in the Warsaw Ghetto was a Roman Catholic church staffed by Romans, attended by Roman Catholic parishioners such as yourself, staffed by Roman Catholic priests such as yourself and Roman Catholic nuns, this was the only building left standing. Why? Because there were people there whom the state annihilated because they were Jews, who were faithful Christians to the very end. Definition of Jews became, definition became the first step in destruction. And then what you had was the collapse of what you would call civil society. And we have to understand what involves the collapse of civil society. That culminated in an evening which was given a fancy name, Kristallnacht. A crystal is beautiful. The Germans now call it, German historians now call it, the November uh, Reichs pogroms of 1938. 30,000 Jews, Jewish men aged 16 to 60 were arrested. 7,000 businesses were looted and destroyed, and more than 1,000 uh, synagogues were set on fire. And that was the eruption 
of massive violence, and you have to understand that one of the achievements of Jews in Germany had been that the synagogue had become a central place that was identified, identified as part of the presence of Jews in the community. And the synagogue between 1933 and 1938 had transformed itself. And think of a synagogue as how do you respond, as it were, to catastrophe. So on Monday, the synagogue became a welfare office. On Tuesday, it became an immigration office. On Monday night, it might become a theater because Jews were not allowed, actors were not allowed to perform in the theater. On, Monday, on Tuesday night, it might become a concert hall. On Wednesday night, it might become an opera. It became a language training center and a school. Because as the world closed down, it evolved. And then on Friday night and Shabbat, it became a place in which people came together to pray. And they prayed in a very unique way because prayer can become a weapon. A weapon of resistance, as you sometimes know, in your own prayers. How do you pray if you want to communicate and you can't speak freely? There's a prayer Rabbi Taft can certainly recite it by heart. He recites it every day, probably three times a day. It's called the adoration. It says, we bend our knees and we bow down before the King of the King of the Kings, the Holy One, blessed be He. And Rabbi Leo Beck, who was a prominent rabbi, wanted to signal how to behave. He said, add it to it, but we stand erect before man. We bow before God, but we stand erect before man. What is he trying to tell you? That man is not God. Certainly not that man, and certainly not at that moment. The synagogue becomes this place, and then it's destroyed, and there's nothing for the community. But immediately thereafter, there's a meeting on the 12th of November. I'm a pain in the posterior historian, so I read documents. This document is a gathering of the, all of the ministries of the German state and the party that were implicated by the November pogroms. And one industry is represented, which tells you something peculiar. What industry had to be represented at the conference? The insurance industry. Why? Because every property that was destroyed was insured. And if the insurance industry did not pay, they would lose their credibility. And this is a trick question. If they did pay, who would be the ultimate loser of the event? Now, most of you are going to say the insurance companies, but you know insurance companies never lose money. They pass on their losses to what? To the consumers, so the German people would have to pay for their losses. So what did they decide? They decided at that meeting that the insurance companies would stand to pay out, but Jews were not allowed to file a claim. And that the total amount of damages would be a fine imposed on the Jewish community, and immediately thereafter, something else would happen, which is that if we've gone this far, we're going to go much further. Jews were expelled from schools. Jews were not allowed to ride public transit. Imagine you can no longer have a car. Jews were not even have allowed to have a driver's license. If you don't have a car, you can't use public transit. Jews had to be identified, so after January 1st, Jews had to identify if they were men, they had to take the middle name of Israel. If they were women, they had to take the middle, the middle name of Sarah. And essentially, they structured in, and they came to one more conclusion, which is that unplanned violence, without considering all of its consequences, was not going to be tolerated. Planned violence was a different matter. 
Let's push ahead for a moment. The war begins with the German invasion of Poland. They put the Jews ultimately within months into a ghetto. And the ghetto has two perspectives. And when I teach this, you have to understand that the ghetto has one perspective of the perpetrator and the other perspective of the victim. For the perpetrator, it was a way to contain Jews, isolate them, and segregate them until. For the victims, for the Jews, it was a place to live until. Neither side at that moment knew until what. In retrospect, but only in retrospect, it was a place, the Jews believed it was a place to live and you had to create a life in a confined space. Jews constituted 33% of the city of Warsaw, 2.3% of the territory was given to the ghetto, isolated with no economy. Jews thought that this was a place to live until the Nazis came to the census, until Germany was defeated, until the war was won. And for the Germans, it was a place to contain the Jews until a decision was made what to do with them, and the infrastructure was built for their destruction. This was then called the final solution to the Jewish problem. Let's step back for one moment and say that we have a problem. The implications of how we got that far become important for almost profession by profession of American, uh, of world, of Western society. Physicians use the opportunity of the start of the war to implement a policy of eugenics and euthanasia. I say the first to be gassed were not Jews. The first to be gassed were, and I'm going to use non-PC language, mentally retarded, physically infirm, emotionally distraught, handicapped Germans, Aryans, who were an embarrassment to the myth of Aryan supremacy. That's where the gas chambers were begun. And that's where the staff was trained that began by killing hundreds and then thousands. And ultimately they then graduated to the gas chambers of Treblinka, Sopobor, and, um, and Belgians. And they killed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, adding up well over two million. Lawyers made sure everything was done legally. No crime was committed. Businessmen developed a, the idea that the ultimate use of labor is the cheapest labor is slave labor where you don't have to pay. You don't have to feed and the slave became dispensable. We'll come to that in a moment. Philosophers justified it. Cultural figures said, okay, now we can go back to German music get rid of this foreign Jewish influence. Ghettoization develops, and then Germany expands, and you have a problem. It wants to get rid of the Jews, but as it wants to get rid of the Jews, the universe is expanding. It expands in 1938 into Austria, in 1938 into Czechoslovakia, in 1939 into Czechoslovakia, into Poland. And everywhere it expands, more and more and more and more Jews come under its control. So you can't get rid of the Jews if you're expanding and controlling more Jews, unless somebody's willing to take the Jews, and the West was not forthcoming with avenues of asylum, of refuge. Conferences failed. Countries were not willing to accept the Jews. And in fact, they called it the refugee problem because in the words of one scholar, had they distinguished between Christian refugees and Jewish refugees, they would have accepted the Christian refugees and not the Jews. So far, Jews are not systematically murdered. 
June 22nd, 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union, Soviet-held territories. They bring with them 3,000 men whose task is to round up Jews, Soviet commissars, and um, gypsies, Roma and Sinti, to bring them to the edge of a city, to bring them to the edge of a valley, and to shoot them one by one by one by one. This is called murder by bullets, the Holocaust by bullets. We now know something enormously important. There's a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Father Dubois. Father Dubois, with his collar, has been operating in the areas of Eastern Europe, interviewing people in their 90s, who were little children when this occurred. They see a Roman Catholic priest, and they're now willing to confess and to show not what they did, but what they witnessed, and where these mass graves are located. When you look at that, you look at something that's very interesting because killing was personal. You had to what be shoot a person. You even had a design in which if you drew a ditch in which to bury them and you shot at a distance, they fall in, they fell in naturally. And this is what they did in town after town, village after village, hamlet after hamlet, men, women, and children. And this is the way in which they operated, but they didn't operate alone. In Lithuania, two out of three Jews were killed not by, Lith not by Germans, but by Lithuanians. In Latvia, 60% of the Jews who were killed were killed by Latvians. In Estonia, 100% of the Jews who were murdered were murdered by Estonians. With the principle of the old accusation that was made by the prophet or have you murdered and also inherited? And then all of a sudden they decided, no, 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 no. If we do the killing, we can take the property. If they do the killing, the Germans take the mobile property. There was a problem with this stage of killing, which says something very interesting about human beings. People needed to, the killers needed to drink afterwards. And gradually they needed to drink before, and sometimes they needed to drink during. And then the Holocaust becomes the Holocaust when something becomes reversed. If you can't send mobile killers to stationary victims, what is your next possibility? You make the victims mobile, and you send them to stationary killing centers that combine Ford's notion of the assembly line with Darwin's notion of survival of the fittest. If you send them to stationary killing centers, the killing becomes impersonal by process. And consequently, it becomes easier to sustain less taxing on the killers, and more capable of what? Of being operational for a very long time. Six killing centers were established, and let me give you again Mark Twain's Truth, Lies, and Statistics. But the statistics will tell it to you very simply. Belgians. 500,000 Jews were killed between February 1942 and December 1942. There were two known survivors. 500,000 murdered, two known survivors. The staff was 104 of whom 14 were Germans, 90 were Ukrainians. Treblinka had 925,000 people killed between the 23rd of July and the, uh, 1942 and the, second, the 4th of August, 1943. In 13 months, 925,000 killed. Think of that. 
staff of 120, 30 Germans, 90 Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians were people who had been first collaborative with the Soviet Union and then showed their allegiance to Germany by turning and becoming instruments of the Nazis. Then there was this camp we call Auschwitz. Now there's going to be opening in the United States at the Ronald Reagan Library if you get down to Los Angeles. They'll be opening a major exhibition called Auschwitz not long ago, not far away. And this has been in Madrid, it's been in New York, it's been in Kansas City, it's now in Malmo, which is a way in which we bring Auschwitz to the people. Auschwitz was actually not one place, but three places. Auschwitz I was a prison camp for Polish prisoners. Auschwitz III was something called Buna Manowitz, which was a German industrial complex in which Nazi corporations, German corporations, invested 700 million Reichsmarks in 1942. Now, some of you are in business and you understand the investment of 700 million Reichsmarks, which is 400 million 1942 dollars is not a what? A one-year investment, it's a capital investment to be amortized over years. In fact, to this day, it is the largest industrial complex in Poland, because the idea was that slave labor would become a permanent reality of the Nazi universe. And Auschwitz II, Auschwitz II was something called Birkenau, beautiful birch tree. And Birkenau was the death camp in which 1.1 million people were murdered. And when you come to Auschwitz, you think of essentially, and by the way, you then see the process. You arrive, you face a Nazi doctor, and then there's a selection. Men to one side, women to the other, women with children, children stay with their mothers. Those who were young and able-bodied were selected to live. They then faced, they were tattooed, they were branded, they were sheared, their hair was cut, and they were used to work until they no longer had strength to work, then they were sent back to the gas chamber. Most who arrived were sent immediately to their death. Death was by gassing. Death was in crematory in gas chambers. And we have uh, models of the gas chambers, including the design. And then some very specific detail shows you something very peculiar about this gassing. The gassing came on a Red Cross truck. Not a real Red Cross truck, because the Red Cross didn't do the gassing, but a truck that was painted with a Red Cross. Now why? If you see a Red Cross, what do you believe is awaiting you? Help, healing, and compassion. Right? We've all been through emergencies, and what does the Red Cross represent? Somebody cares, somebody's there to help you, and you're going to be treated with great compassion. The gas was dropped down, and a very specific detail, they misdesigned two of the gas chambers. Because where should you put gas? You should put gas in the bottom because gas what? Rises. They misdesigned it, so they then corrected it. So they built a double cage in which you lowered the gas down into the cage. You kept it there for 25 minutes. And then you raised it up from its basket and you allowed it to dissipate in the air. And therefore they could murder 2,000 people in 30 minutes at a cost of one half of one cent a person. 
And how do I know that? Because an accountant did the accounting of precisely how it was done. So why is Auschwitz Auschwitz? Auschwitz is Auschwitz because it represented the systematic degradation of the human being, the worst form of slavery, not slavery, it represented using the human being as a consumable raw material to be discarded in the process of manufacturing and recycled. Now you have to be a son of a gun historian to understand one other thing. What's the one other thing? There was no budget for this. No state funds were to be used, even though the state paid for the whole thing. It had to be a profit-making operation, which meant that this industrialized killing was designed to make a profit and to benefit the state, the industry, and even the individuals. So Auschwitz, why does Auschwitz represent the epitome? Because it's the most sophisticated construction of an industrial complex designed to annihilate the human being, but to take everything of value in the human being and make it useful. Gold was taken from teeth, hair was used as a detonator, and I'm out public that they didn't make Jews into soap, not because they didn't try, but because there was no longer enough flesh on the Jews to make the human fat worthwhile, but they used it to salt roads and they used it to fertilize fields. So this becomes the epitome of evil. Now let's say a couple of things that it's not all. The killing is the awful evil, but we have instances, instances which showed that opposition to evil was possible. Let's take Archbishop Roncalli, your saint and my saint, John the 23rd. John the 23rd did three things that are enormously important. He had a historical interesting thing that occurred. You all know about the story of the Danish rescue. The Danes rescued their Jewish community essentially because they treated the Jews like fellow citizens. Great moral achievement of Denmark was, when you interview the Danes, what do they say? We didn't do anything heroic, we merely treated our fellow citizens like fellow citizens when a hostile occupying power comes to destroy them, which means we reached out in a friendship. The Bulgarians did something very interesting, which is they murdered, they participated in the murder of the Jews of Trace in Macedonia, and then the civil society rose up and did not allow for the murder of Bulgarian citizens. So Bulgaria claims that we did save more Jews than, than Denmark, technically correct, but only after we killed the Jews who were not citizens, the Jews of Trace in Macedonia. What is Archbishop Roncalli do. He writes to the king of Bulgaria that your soul will not withstand the murder of your Jewish citizens. An act of courage. One doesn't write to kings like that. Except if what? One has moral character of the highest magnitude. He then sends a very interesting document that is used to save some Jews in Hungary. He works with the Jewish underground, which is desperately alone in Turkey, and Turkey was a neutral country. And he sends a document which is technically correct and misleading. It becomes a little bit like Wallenberg Schutz Pass, Wallenberg's. He says the following. He says, the holder of this, and he writes it in, in, in um, uh, Turkish, so they can't quite discern what he's saying, but it has his stamp on it. 
He says, the holder of this document is a fellow countryman of Jesus and should be entitled to the Vatican's protection. Fellow countrymen of Jesus is another way of saying the J-E-W word. And he doesn't say they are entitled to Vatican protection, he said they should be entitled to Vatican protection. So the document is used to confuse and to offer the possibility. Let's take a look at your second saint, my saint, John Paul II. John Paul II, you have to understand, grew up with Jews. Lived in Poland, he was a man of the theater, a man of the university, he had Jewish friends, and he had very close Jewish friends, and how do we know he had Jewish friends? What's the best evidence? That when he became Pope, he asked one of his Israeli, his Israeli friends to take an apartment in take an apartment in Rome so that somebody could walk in and believe that he was not infallible. <laughs> in other words, he wanted somebody in his life who was a friend with whom he was not necessarily Pope in keeping what with his normal human character. He does something else that is, and by the way, he does something else that's enormously courageous. And I want you gentlemen to think of this as parish priests. There were very great Poles who in 1941 and 42 took Jewish children and raised them as their own. Now you have to understand what it means, first of all, see it as parents. Many of you are parents. What does it mean to you to understand the situation is so dire that the only way to save your child is to give the child up? I interviewed one person who did this, and he said his wife was never again intimate with him. She knew he had saved their child, but never again could she share his bed. He rescued his child, but he took the child away from the mother. And that was, they stayed married. In 1942, 43, 44, 45, you couldn't tell a child they were Jewish because if you told them that was what? To not only kill them, but to kill you. In 1946, 47, 48, in the turmoil in post-war Poland, you were afraid that you would be labeled a Jew lover. You didn't tell the child. And you know if you have an adopted child that you haven't told their origin, the longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes. What did John Paul II do when he was a young parish priest, much to the anger of, his, of the best in his parish? He would not baptize, and probably against Catholic teaching, he would not baptize these children until their parents told them who they were, and where they had come from. You gotta imagine what a conversation like that. You, got, you guys are priests. You gotta imagine what it means when a parent brings you a child for baptism and you say you have one more obligation to do. But he insisted on integrity. And by the way, when we think of it, let's again say, why do I say that this is, these are my saints as well as yours? Because what did John the 23rd do? Saint John the 23rd. He confronted anti-Semitism. He studied anti-Semitism with a scholar by the name of Jules Zazak. 
confronted anti-Semitism and he transformed the Roman Catholic Church's teaching about the crucifixion with one of the most incredible documents called Nostra Tate. His next successor once removed, John Paul II, St. John Paul II, what does he do? In one sense, John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd, St. John the 23rd, came to terms with 1948 years of Jewish life. And John Paul II came to terms by recognizing the state of Israel. And then he did something that was quite remarkable. He said, anti-Semitism is anti-Christian. We had never heard such words. He went to Israel and he apologized for the anti-Semitism of some Christians. And Pope Francis in recent years ended the mission to the Jews, saying that we are at home what in our own faith. And the covenant between God and Israel continues and endures. This is one of the great acts of religious repentance by trying to remove the teachings within Roman Catholicism that could possibly lead to anti-Semitism. And you should be deeply proud of these transformations. In the history of religion, they are monumental. They are enormously significant. And they lead to what has become this is the greatest time in history to be a Jew and Catholic in dialogue. Both religions are improved by that. The spirituality of both communities are improved by that. And you've removed elements that could possibly lead to anti-Semitism. Let me conclude. And, you know, I... I, I Joke there, there used to be, when I came to Washington very early, when I came to Washington, there was a um, man who later became vice president by the name of Hubert Humphrey. And we had a joke, the optimist in the crowd was the woman who put on her um, uh, high heels when Hubert Humphrey said in conclusion for the ninth time. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bill Clinton and Donald Trump both improved on that. What's unique about the Holocaust and why does it demand remembrance? The scope of the ter German determination to kill the Jews. The Germans sought to eliminate all Jews everywhere, men, women, and children, to recast the nature of the human species. Previous anti-Semitism, and I'm going to go in for 10 seconds to anti-Semitism because it's an issue today. Anti-Semitism varies by source. Religious, political, social, economic, racial. Anti-Semitism varies by goal. If you're a religious anti-Semite, you want to convert the Jews. If you're a political anti-Semite, you want to diminish their political power. If you're a social anti-Semitism, anti-Semite, you don't want the member of your club, your neighborhood, your bed. If you're a racial anti-Semitism, anti-Semite, you destroy, you want the Jews eliminated. And that ultimately led to what they called extermination, which is a, a, a vicious word, because that's what we do to rodents. I never try to use that except if I'm quoting a Nazi document, I speak of annihilation. Anti-Semitism also differs as to the priority. Hitler was an anti-Semite in public from 1919 to his final words in 1945. And I can document where, where anti-Semitism essentially took priority over the world war. Quick evidence is in 19, the two times that Nazis killed most Jews were 1942 and 44. 
42 was a moment in which they were on a war in the Soviet Union that they were losing. And 44, they were in a two-front war in the Soviet Union and if, with Soviet troops invading from the what? From the East and American and Allied troops invading from the West and from the South. That's when they destroyed Hungarian Jews. Differs as to its priority. And the last point is it differs profoundly by how stable a society is. And Jews are normally a canary in the mine. If a society is unstable, Jews become the victims of that instability. And Lord knows we live in an unstable world, which is one of the reasons why we have an increase in anti-Semitism. Nazi effort to eliminate the Jews was relentless, even to the detriment of World War II. And finally, the instrumentalities employed in that destruction were instrumentalities which structured killing and death, ultimately to make it impersonal and to make it... You had, uh, and I, I demonstrate this sometimes when I teach, you had various types of, t of killers. And ironically, the most lethal of all killers were people who lifted up nothing heavier than a pen. We call them death killers. And it was done by bureaucracy, which meant that nobody felt responsible for the final product, but you had the fragmentation. So we remember tonight. We remember that tragic past, that catastrophic past, because only if we confront evil can we learn the importance of doing good, only if we remember hatred and if we understand that responding to hatred demands courage and decency and the best of human values and the best of religious values. Can we make sure that that does not happen again, at least not with our consent, at least not with our active opposition? And we try to instill in ourselves the values not to become perpetrators, not to become victims and not to become bystanders, but to become upstanders. I just have to say, uh, every time I have listened to Dr. Michael Berenbaum, I have been enlightened. Even with all of the courses I've had over the years as a college student, a rabbinical student studying the Holocaust, it never ever ceases to amaze me how much more information, knowledge, wisdom I glean when I listen to you, Dr. Berenbaum. God bless you. And Michael, Congratulations to you on your most recent appointment by the governor of the state of California to the governor's council on Holocaust and genocide education. Well deserved. I want to thank uh, Father Vaughn too for, and, and also Father, uh, is it Kab Kaburu? Um, I don't know if he's here. Are you here, Father? Thank you both, and thank you to your team of clergy and your dedicated lay leaders for agreeing to host this uh, very important evening of remembrance. Uh, we're very, very grateful. To you, Bishop Soto, how nice to see you again. And I will never forget when you spoke at our congregation after you had arrived here uh, to assume your new position. But I will also never forget 
Bishop Soto. After the murder of 11 Jewish people in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, when you called me up and asked if you could come and worship at our synagogue with us. And I said, Bishop, we would be honored, but only if you would share some words. And you said, no, I don't need to share any words. I just want to worship with you and be there with you and your community. And when you did show up, I called upon you to share some words. <laughs> and I have to say, how comforting it was not just to have you in our presence, but how comforting your words were as we were all grieving that terrible, terrible tragedy in Pittsburgh. God bless you and thank you. I want to say to um, uh, Bishop Emeritus Wiegand, uh, I'm going to talk about you in a moment, but uh, how blessed I was when a member of my congregation, may his memory be for a blessing by the name of Willie Weiss. No one could, uh, no one could um, really know, was it pr the pronunciation Weiss or Weiss? He always told me it was Weiss. He was a European Jew who lived in Sacramento for many years. And when I first arrived in Sacramento, he implored me, I must meet the new bishop, Bishop Wiegand. And so look, I said, this is my first congregation as a rabbi. I, I need, uh, give me a few months, give me a year, then I'll reach out to the bishop says, no, you have to do it. Anyway, he called your secretary and made an appointment for me without telling me. <laughs> and we had our first meeting in your study at the diocese office on Broadway. And that began a friendship uh, of all these years how blessed we were to host you at our congregation, and how blessed I was when you invited me several months later to deliver the homily at the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament. Supposedly, it was the first time a rabbi had given the homily at a mass of which you officiated that Sunday morning. As a matter of fact, I think there were more Jews in that cathedral that morning than you have ever seen. Anyway, it's an honor to be here with you. Monsignor Murphy, uh, congratulations on the recent publishing of your new book. Uh, I do not expect a commission for my endorsement, uh, <laughs> but I want you to know how blessed uh, I am to know you, and um, every single person here better buy the book and have him sign it afterwards. And Liz Egra, the founder of the Central Valley Holocaust Educators Network, a survivor of the Holocaust, who is here. Stand up, Liz. <laughs> Liz Egra, if you don't know who she is, she may be small in physical stature, but she is a giant of a woman who came to me years ago and said, we need to have a Holocaust educators network. We need to have a library and resource center. And uh, she convinced me to call Dr. Berenbaum who flew to Sacramento. I remember Dr. Berenbaum, you were in Europe and you called me back and said it would be an honor to come to Sacramento to help dedicate the C.V. Henn Library and Resource Center. So, Liz, you're my role model and my teacher. God bless you. And Jody, thank you for continuing the important work that Liz has started. Jody Cooper.
God bless you. Okay. Uh, so, um, Monsignor um, Murphy had asked me to share the story of uh, when Bishop Wiegand spoke to our synagogue. So here is the story. It was May of 1998, and Bishop Wiegand had accepted my invitation. You know, before I even say that, I, I see Michael Kiernan here, and Father Kiernan, God bless you. All the years that we had a Yom Hoshawah commemoration, you always were front and center representing the Catholic community. God bless you. You're a dear friend. We love you, Michael. By the way, Michael, you and I were on Catholic television together several years ago. How do I know? Because a member of my congregation emailed me the next day. He says, I saw you and a Catholic priest on Catholic television. He said, you know, it was a pretty good uh, discussion. And, and then I said, well, what time was it on? He said, three o'clock in the morning. Is that Catholic prime time or something? <laughs> All right. Now to my story. So in May of 1998, Bishop Wiegand accepted my invitation to come on a Sabbath morning, on a Shabbat morning, to our synagogue to speak, marking the 50th anniversary of the State of Israel. That was in 1998. And when I introduced the bishop to the congregation, I mentioned that he and I had something in common. You see, we both came to Sacramento to assume new positions in the community, and we both had significant shoes to fill. You see, Bishop Wiegand had succeeded Bishop Quinn who was beloved by so many in our community. How many of you remember Bishop Quinn? A tough act to follow. But I told the congregation on that Shabbat morning in May of 1998, and I told Bishop Wiegand when I introduced him, that I had it even tougher, as my predecessor's name was Rabbi Lionel Moses also beloved within our congregation and community. And thus, while Bishop Wiegand had to succeed Bishop Quinn, I had to follow Moses. <laughs> so I think I had it a little tougher. But folks, I will never forget that Shabbat morning when Bishop Wiegand spoke to our congregation. You see, in the middle of his homily, in the middle of his sermon, which was about the current state of Jewish-Catholic relations, he mentioned to the congregation about his visit to Auschwitz about a year before. And he shared with us the enormity of the evil of the Shoah and how it truly overwhelmed him. And all of a sudden, he looked up from his prepared text, and there was about a 10 second pause. And as he gazed out upon our congregation, trying to hold back tears, he reached for his pectoral cross, and he held it tightly in his hand. And with tremendous emotion in his voice, he said, and I quote, as Catholic Bishop of Sacramento, I declare before you my profound and anguished sorrow for the blood and tears that have been inflicted upon your people by those who were Catholics in deep humility, I ask your pardon and forgiveness." End quote. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there was a deafening silence in that sanctuary that morning. And I looked out upon the members of my congregation and those in the Jewish community who knew that the bishop was coming to speak and wanted to hear his words. And when he concluded his remarks, I embraced him and said publicly, Bishop Wiegand, there are no adequate words other than to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. After the service concluded, we all gathered for lunch in our social hall, and two members of our congregation, two elderly members of our congregation, in fact, I don't like the, the word elderly. I'm going to call them two uh, members of my congregation in their wise years of life. I like that. They came over to me and they asked if I would introduce them to Bishop Wiegand. Both of them were Holocaust survivors who spent a considerable time in Auschwitz. Their names were Gisela Spiegel and Toba Grinbaum. And as I introduced them to Bishop Wiegand, they both showed him the number tattooed on their arm. And Gisela said to the bishop, and I'll never forget it, she said, and I quote Bishop Wiegand, Never in my lifetime did I ever expect to hear such words of contrition from a leader of the Catholic Church. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and may God bless you. Bishop Wiegand was visibly moved, and his arms reached out to embrace Gisela and Toba. They both have passed away, but I know that they were deeply touched, as we all were, by Bishop Wiegand's profound words, which will be indelibly etched into our hearts and into our souls. So I thank you for allowing me to share this amazing story that I will never, ever forget. And I want to thank each and every one of you, especially those in the Catholic community who braved the weather to come out here tonight to express your solidarity with the Jewish people as we observe International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And today, as you all know, as we were reminded by Dr. Berenbaum, we also celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. And at the same time, we also honor the 50th anniversary of the passing of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Two faith leaders who marched hand in hand a task that it is as ever important today as it was over five decades ago. One of my colleagues in Los Angeles, Rabbi Erez Sherman, sent a message to his congregation at Sinai Temple before the Sabbath began on Friday. And he quoted Dr. King and he quoted Rabbi Heschel. In his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King said, and I quote, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. End quote. 
It's easy to see a mountain in front of your eyes, too difficult to climb. It's difficult to see a stone, a pebble, mixed into its surrounding environment. Yet when that stone of hope is uncovered, as Rabbi Heschel wrote, and I quote, we meet as human beings who have so much in common, a heart, a face, a heart, a face, a voice, the presence of a soul, fears, hope, the ability to trust, a capacity for compassion and understanding, the kinship of being human. End quote. May these words be a harbinger for continued dialogue, trust, compassion, and understanding, not only between our Catholic and Jewish communities, but with our brothers and sisters of all faiths for many years to come. And let us all say Amen. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Taft. Uh, just, uh, just add a few, a few words. <clears throat> the story he told actually tied in with, with Auschwitz, as, as he mentioned. Uh, the year before the invitation to to visit on that Shabbat uh, Saturday morning on May 9th, I think it was, in 1970, uh, 1998, uh, I led a, a group from Sacramento of about 35 people on a pilgrimage to, to Poland. Uh, the, the, it was the occasion of the International Eucharistic Congress, uh, but in the uh, 10 days or two weeks, uh, we went to any number of uh, religious uh, uh, places, but also to Auschwitz. And the, the group spent, uh, oh, I would say two or three hours at, at Auschwitz on a, on a given day, and uh, kind of like tourists in one sense, uh, kind of guided uh, uh, to uh, kind of a fast trip through uh, Auschwitz uh, uh, Birkenau. And, uh, uh, we, we had this, uh, this uh, image, uh, this experience of, of uh, seeing the cells and the, the, uh, the bales of human hair meant for industrial use uh, in, in producing uh, income, the piles of, of, of shoes and, and the, the gold that was, that was uh, 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 rescued and, and so forth. All of that uh, made, made a huge impression, of course. Uh, the, the cell of, uh, of uh, what, what's the Franciscan saint? Uh, Maximilian Kolbe, and so forth. Well, uh, the following day, there were other activities in, in uh, uh, the pilgrimage group, which I skipped. And I went back on the next day uh, alone. I took a taxi and uh, spent several more hours uh, because of that, uh, the experience of the enormity of evil, the, 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 the absolute uh, uh, climax of evil, which at the same time I experienced, Paul, uh, in, the, in that second day at Auschwitz, uh, it was also holy ground of, of, the, of the hundreds of thousands of people uh, murdered at uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, they gave their lives. They were innocent, uh, and and uh, uh, they were martyred, huh? uh, and uh, uh, went to God. You can be sure God was uh, was and is very good to them. So it's holy ground because of the of the people martyred, and so that dichotomy between the 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 the. the uh, uh, a climax and the, the maximum of, of evil, the enormity of evil, and yet at the same time the, uh, the holiness of people uh, that have gone through that experience. And 
So I, I was, I was uh, um, drawn to both of those. And so it was a day of meditation, basically. Uh, so fast forward a, a year, and a, a, a Rabbi Taff invites me on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the, of the State of Israel and, and so forth. And, and uh, a, a theologian on my staff helped me prepare the remarks and, and so forth. Uh, 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 Father Sylvester McDermott had now also gone to his reward. And I told him I had to mention the visit to, uh, to uh, Auschwitz. And he said, you may not. And I said, he said, stick to the theme. It's the 50th anniversary and of, of the state of Israel. And he said, besides, coming from you, any of us, what you might say will, will, will sound uh, hollow. It might well do more harm than good. So stick to the theme. <laughs> and I said, I will not. <laughs> so together we put in, and it was not in the middle, but basically at the end of my talk, I said, if I might be permitted a personal uh, 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 reminisce, uh, uh, re reminiscence, I visited Auschwitz in early June of last year. In fact, I went twice, not just once, as had been my intention. And it was at that point that I had to pause. I couldn't go on. It's before I got to the asking of, of, of forgiveness. and and. Uh, it was great emotion as I thought back to my time at Auschwitz and the enormity of evil. And, but it was more than that. It was, it was uh, like the, this, this deep, this huge um, sadness uh, and sorrow that, that welled up from my soul, in a sense, and just kind of overwhelmed me, uh, thinking of, of, of what people did to people. And the mystery of that, and the the uh, 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 how how it, you simply can't understand it. And uh, but in the meantime, I was also uh, I wear glasses. Uh, I I was uh, misting. I was uh, I I was uh, <laughs> sobbing basically, uh, and I couldn't see the text. <laughs> So I, I pulled out my handkerchief and was trying to clean off my glasses a little bit. And uh, 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 at a certain point, Rabbi Ta uh, uh, Taff, that was kind of sitting uh, behind me, came over, put his, as I recall, uh, put a hand on my shoulder, but handed me some, some tissues, a box of tissues, <laughs> and so forth. And with that help, I, I went on to the, to the, the next in, most important sentence, as Catholic Bishop of Sacramento, I declare before you my profound and anguished sorrow for the blood and tears. I was quoting Cardinal Ratzinger with blood and tears, who, uh, 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 Pope Benedict uh, XVI, who just died, who, who, who uh, that among other things, uh, a few years before that, had, he had spoken in, in, in Jerusalem. And, uh, but as I was saying that, it was like, it, it was halting. I, I was still dealing with my, my emotions, and it was coming out in spits, and, and uh, I wasn't sure people could even uh, understand it, but uh, uh, Gisela and Doma afterwards clearly heard me say, <laughs> uh, because they, they quoted it to me, uh, I ask your pardon and forgiveness. Uh, they heard it, uh, in spite of the halting kind of, uh, of, of put, which I, I mention all of that because words, words don't do it. You can write that or you can say it in normal. It, it, it is hot. It's cheap. It's easy to say. Uh, I'm sorry, or I ask uh, your pardon and forgiveness in the name of Catholics uh, who have uh, 
uh, not understood the message of the gospel of, of Christ for one thing and, and have uh, have been a part one way or another in the blood and, and, and tears that your people down through the centuries have uh, uh, have experienced, uh, have been inflicted uh, upon them. And so in this case, I, I firmly I believe God helped me. I mean, I, I'm kind of a control freak, frankly. <laughs> Uh, I can't think of another time in public life that I kind of broke down, or as uh, uh, Jim Murphy says, I lost it. <laughs> uh, and, but it's, it's like it was, it was supposed to be something that, so the only way it could be authentic is, is, is the way God permitted it to come out. It was, it was, uh, it was authentic. Uh, it was, but it was it was understood as authentic. So that uh, Jasala and, and Toba uh, 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 afterwards uh, uh, said thank you and thank you, and uh, I uh, you, you said uh, I hugged them. My recollection is they hugged me. <laughs> anyway, we hugged. <laughs> But uh, what a and I might say too, as we were, uh, and soon after there was a, a couple of, of, of paragraphs that I should have probably just skipped because uh, it was superfluous. But uh, the, uh, the the sermon came to an end, and there was a hymn, and uh, I I followed the leaders and the and the uh, the Torah out and. and and so forth, and so so leaving the 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 uh, the, the, the podium and, and going out. Uh, I mean, I I was just uh, uh, deeply uh, aware of of the holiness, like of God's presence, the Holy Spirit uh, present uh, in, in that exchange, and it was not planned. Uh, uh, Rabbi Taft probably wouldn't invite me if he knew what was going to happen there. <laughs> but uh, so it was not planned. Uh, God was good. Uh, just a follow-up. Yes, uh, it was. It took me a whole year and a half after that to get you to the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament. I, today I looked it up. It was on November 21, 1999, which was very significant. In, in our Catholic uh, ecumenism and interfaith uh, work, one of, the, one of the important principles is reciprocity. You don't, you don't uh, accept an invitation to do something if you can't reciprocate. So the reciprocity. So, uh, I was uh, quite aware of that, as a matter of fact, in, in any case, a year and a half later. Uh, but it was on a very significant occasion at the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament. It was the last Sunday of the liturgical year, which for us is Christ the King Sunday. Uh, uh, Christ our King and our theology uh, uh, because of the cross. Uh, uh, Jesus who gave his life, uh, in total love uh, uh, for humanity, and uh, so on the and scriptures go along with that. But my recollection, I, uh, perhaps yours can be better, that you gave a marvelous uh, uh, sermon on on the love and mercy of God, the the Hashem of God. Is, is that the right word, Hashem? Hashem. Hashem. Loving kindness. The loving kindness of God, and of course, on on Christ the King Sunday, I mean, it was perfect, and uh, it was a wonderful conclusion to to our liturgical year of that uh, of, of that year. So, thank you very much for for that occasion, for the invitation, and Dr. Berenbaum, uh, I can't uh, tell you how grateful I am for the your insights and for your. Uh, your decision uh, to accept the invitation to come up to be with us tonight. And 
God bless all of you. Hello, my name is uh, Nikolai Hope Franco, but now you're American Nick Hope. I'm Holocaust survivor, not one, but twice, rather than like in Germany and also Ukraine. I was born in uh, 1924 in Ukraine, Donbass, where there's no war there. Uh, it was a real bad time in Ukraine. And uh, we were always suffer, 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 especially when the communists come. And Papa uh, Stalin make artificial living, you know, and uh, all of the more, where there's more than a million people, innocent people perish, including to my brothers. 1941, Hitler come. And because I was young, 20 years, he ran for the young people. They go to Germany to work there. And they bring me to the Germany. Uh, everything go by force. Uh, and uh, put in a factory, a military factory, Wolfenshausen, where I work a while. And then uh, have a big uh, explosion. Uh, it was a wall. That I was uh, like I was sabotaging or nothing. And then after that, they put me in concentration camp. Dachau. Dachau Allah. You know, I arrived in 1943. There, what really hurt me, and uh, really I was upset when I see them right the first day that I come arrive. You know, that I think it, uh, it's some man, young man, the uh, prisoner. I talk to them, and something I don't know, they maybe don't give him a salute or something. He said, He like that much, much, he like that much, much. That means down, up, down, up, till he can get up. And then uh, we take a gun, we shoot him right there on the place, you know. But nobody say anything, nobody cry, nobody, no, nothing. I said, how did it come? That's, that's the Dachau show here, their face. But then I stay about a <clears throat> couple of months there till they chose to the factory, about 15 minutes away. A bunker Harley building, that's terrible, the cement and Ooh, I was at 75 pounds, it's almost an age. Another thing, they come a big wagon platform and a big pile of dead people. And I put it right on the top, this man. And I, I hear this still on the bottom, the man was dead. And I, oh, please help me. Terrible. Did I always say, oh boy, when I see that, what's gonna happen next? And then again, after all, oh, three months or so, we get to to factory, they have a, where they put in the work there. It was lucky they bring us in the inside, in the, in the building. It was better, you know. But there's another problem. The, come to the superintendent, the Eisenbart, his follower there, you know, that they, they don't hate me. They hate me, I was like, they can't kick me, man. The words are terrible. I was real upset, you know, that thing. I said, oh, well, well, now I have to wait worse. Then I, he signed me for 25 lashes, uh, if I made a mistake. And worse and worse and worse. Uh, every day, bomb at the uh, factory, and I go to Dead March. I want to take part in the Dead March, and they bring us in the forest. I want to kill it, but the American make it free. That's a wonderful thing, was I would see the American tank. The boy had yelled and cried and cried and he did. Yeah, boy, that's something. We are free. We are free. After that, uh, they bring us to the camp all together. We go with his country. I don't want to go to Russia in any place. But I was a weak cannon. The doctor put me in the hospital. I was stay three years. After three years, that uh, I uh, did work in America. In American. I worked for ten years with America in Munich. Uh, army, uh, and and uh, uh, I met the man that Sergei was a very religious man, and we started to pray. When he said, "Hey, you want to you want to uh, uh, listen to me with a pray together?" If he, because I see you want to quit or smoking, drinking, everything. Yeah, and yes, there was. First I refused, but then says, okay, we pray for together. We pray, but God make a miracle with me. And then after a while, uh, God cut everything. I got real free for this stuff till today. And uh, 
And then I was uh, sick and I get to church. Uh, because when I get to church, uh, and they directed me and gave me a cell phone. I was completely uh, healthy and I can go to the United States. Uh, one day I visit uh, on a employment office uh, and I heard a voice. I said, Bart, I was it him. Yeah, I look at him, we all was fell down. Yeah, our cousins are good friends, you know, that thing. And uh, I say, come and introduce myself. But uh, he says, I can't remember. Go, well, I give me answers. I tell you more about. It. But I say, say, I come home. I say, my wife is my good friend. So oh, I tell her what the whole story. I say, okay, we're gonna pray. She says, hey, Jan and Nadia, what was it? What is? What the Lord says? What we should do with them? Put them in the jail, uh, or beat them, or. Forgive him, you know, that you. After we pray, we make a decision uh, what we do. After one month, uh, I go to Eisenbart home. And I came here and bring me in the cellar. And I started to talk to him. I'm here, Eisenbart. Can you remember me? Because it was, you were skinny and it, now it's a different. Yeah, I am so and so and so, my machine number one. But, oh, oh. And you remember, you write for me, you give me 25 lashes. He'd feel those good, but I remember to write for you one. This one cylinder come there and break with the hanging. The other is Sergei. If some, something happened, you write down hanging. He said, shake it. Every, well, it's, but listen, don't worry now. Forget about because I come here with decision to forgive you. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Look, you person, my person, here, shake my hand. You understand? You don't understand. I forgive you what you do with me and another guy. And then, but why? I said, because uh, God forgive me. He make a very miracle on me. It can be a comic on you because I am gonna pray for you that he changed, completely changed your mind, your behavior, everything. You be another man. We're gonna pray for you. Yeah? And I now I go to the United States. God bless you. But we still pray for you. Good. Now I come to the United States and I God make a so that uh, he bring me out all my family to Calistoga. When I become a job, we get everything, because there was no, no people there. But I developed Calistoga, we built over 100 houses, and God bless me, rich bless me, continue. And uh, I thank to God for all things what he had done. And I think it, it's come to my grandfather, because he, when I was young, he, he always prayed for me. Always, because the seeds come up, you bring the fruits. Because I uh, bless it here, and the blessed uh, health, everything, job, everything I got. And uh, I thank the God and the other brothers in the church and everything. I may be not here. I praise the Lord for that and praise you to listen to me. And God bless you.